and welcome to the Utah Puck Report. I'm your uh, your hockey friend, your host of the hockey show. It's me, Jay Stevens. Uh, tonight, we're just going to talk about the Utah Hockey Club. We're going to get into some stuff, and I needed an expert. I needed someone who knew what they were talking about, so I called up a friend of mine, Mason Manick, former Utah Grizz, former Portland Winterhawk. Mason, how are you? Good, Jay. Thanks for having me on. I'm super excited. I think it's been like six years or something since my last my last feature on the Utah Puck Report. So what? There's no yeah. way. Has it I'm really pretty been sure. Long? I'm pretty sure it was my 18 year old year in Portland. That could be <laughs> wrong, but I'm pretty sure. I see, and I feel so. like I pick on you too much. I thought, man, I always call Mason, and I thought I had you on when you were with the Grizz for sure. Um, no, call me anytime. All right. Well, I'm gonna have to because like you're the NHL's in town now and yeah. every time I say that it blows my mind and now we're going to need like real experts and there are not a lot of real experts that have played at the level that you've played at um have, when you were with Portland did you play with any of these guys that are with Utah Hockey Club uh, um I did I played against Valimac he played in Tri-City when I was there um I don't know him personally or anything but played against him a ton and I'm trying to think if there's any others there's a lot of guys that they played against that I, I know, but I think on Utah, I'm pretty sure he might be the only one that comes to mind right away. Okay. Yeah. I, actually, I, I talked about him in one of my last articles. Um, for me, I think Arizona drafted him and thought he'd be a really offensive defenseman. And I think that's the role he's been filling, but not this year. Yeah. I'm not saying that I can, in a negative way. I think that he's kind of figured some stuff out and like I obviously the expectation is that he was going to score score some goals, but I think like he's having an uh, identity change, mm -hmm. and he's more of a defensive defenseman now, which is fine. His numbers are good. Yeah. Uh, I mean, no points, but his numbers are good. Yeah, he's probably, he's probably got some points. Yeah, no, he's a he's a great defenseman. I know when I played against him, super super skilled, like so much upside, and like he just kind of controlled games and I mean he's still young for the NHL right so once he gets more games more time I'm sure that's going to start showing itself in the NHL level too. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um so let's talk about the last few games of the Utah Hockey Club. I, I know that you and your family are fans. I mm. see you guys at all the games and I know oh, yeah. you're following it. And let's start with the Pittsburgh game because that was mm. it was an important slump buster for us. It was. And I I think even though they lost the next night, I think the confidence boost that Pittsburgh gave us was was huge. And can you just talk a little bit about what you saw going right and what you thought was different than the games that they lost? The biggest thing I think is confidence. Like you can just tell like zone entries or even breaking the puck out. Like they weren't gripping their stick. The like passes were crisp. They were going to the net a lot. They were shooting a lot more. And like to me, from from watching from afar, that would be like kind of the biggest thing that I see. I think they pass up on all the shots, but that Pittsburgh game, I mean, six goals spe speaks for itself. I have written down here in four of the last five games, they had six goals total. And then that game, they put, put up six. So I think just confidence with the puck, getting to the net, all those things they were doing right. And it obviously paid off for them. Yeah, we're 20, 21 games into the season and they've been yeah. shut out five times. Yeah. So at some point, that's got to mess with your head a little bit, right? You Have you been through a slump like that or, or been with teammates or your team gone through something like that? Oh, for sure. I mean, I think any hockey player could attest that at some point. I mean, 82 games is a long time. And so you're going to hit slumps. It doesn't matter. And and I think, I mean, these guys, you got to think of all the things that have been thrown at them in the last year. I mean, they just had to move their whole team to a different city. I mean, things are going to happen, right? But um, when you go through slumps, like, it just takes one instance to really break out of that. And I think the first period of that Pittsburgh game is what it was to me, yeah. but no, I think you're, I think you're hitting it right on the head. Uh, a lot of fans online just keep chirping about shoot, shoot, quit looking for the pass. Yeah. And, and it, I'm going to get into that a little bit more later, but we're, you know, when you look at that and then when you see like the first goal they scored last night in Toronto, that's uh that's because of that extra pass. That's because of that vision and that's one of the reasons you want a guy like that is, or a team like this is they're young and their vision is great. And they're such playmakers. Mm -hmm. Where's the balance between when to shoot and when to pass? That's, that's a really hard, that's a super gray area, right? Well, I'm just going to ask I, you I, real simple questions. Yeah, no, for sure. <laughs> um, no, super gray area. I mean, these guys are, I mean, these are the best players in the world, right? It's like, it, and I would like to say to like all the fans from what it, from what you see from, from the TV or even being at the game, 
it looks like they have a lot more time than you actually do when you're in that game. Like it's like this, right? So, um, but yeah, I don't know. It's like they're they're super skilled and they're playing the NHL for reasons. So when they want to make that extra pass, they believe they can and they're skilled enough to do it. But on the contrary, we lack a little bit of goal scoring, right? So I think the biggest thing for me is it's not always about getting that grade A chance. It's about that maybe grade C, grade B chance that turns into a grade A chance. So I don't know if there's necessarily like, it's hard to say you should do this or you should do that because everything, I mean, hockey happens so fast, right? But I mean, it's, they're so good. It's like, you got to kind of let them do their thing. But from afar, I do understand where fans are coming from, where you'd like to see them shoot a little bit more. Right. And it's easy to say that from a fan. And like it always looks easy up in the box, right? Like it's yeah, exactly. And your nice seat with your nice frosty beverage. I remember though, as a goaltender, I, I had some really good goalie coaches. Um, and you know, the 12 games or whatever I played at Shattuck St. Mary's, I had a coach there that told me, he, he said like, when you're in a slump, just keep it simple, break it down, yeah. like do the basic stuff. And, and then let, let that get you out of the slump, go back to everything else. Like for me, I was overly aggressive. That was one of the main things, like one of the big things that was always knocked on me. Um, well, besides being completely inconsistent. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, because, you know, some, sometimes you have these really great games and everything you did works. So you're going to go, you're going to try that again and it doesn't work the next game. You don't know mm -hmm. why. But that coach was telling me, he's like, just step back. Like instead yeah. of being super aggressive off your goal line, just stay back on your goal line. Be a little bit more... Like let the little things work and then work on the big things later. And I think that's kind of the slump buster mentality. Um, and then that game we saw Schmaltz finally score. Yeah, that was tough. <laughs> yeah, that's really hard because you know what's eating at that kid's head, right? Like you know that it's 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 got to be driving him nuts because he's a goal scorer. Yeah. He had a lot of goals last yeah. year. And for him to not have a goal yet this year, and to score and then have it be a race. But the very next play, this is the one thing that really impressed me about him, is you would think a guy that's going through a slump like that would immediately shoot again and mm -hmm. be like, I have to score, I have to score, I have to score. The next play, he set up an amazing goal. Yeah. And it would have been easy to take that shot, but instead he saw that extra step, he saw that pass, and I think he fed Cooley. I'm, I'm almost positive it was Cooley, but... Yeah. I mean, that's like... The, the mental stability to do that, most hockey players I know don't have that mental uh, maturity to be like, hey, I'm still going to make this pass. Yeah. It's not going to be a goal for me, but it's going to be a pass. Did you yeah. see that? What do you think of that? For sure. I mean, it's super testament to him, right? Like, I mean, everything I've been through isn't nearly on the scale these guys were, but I've been through stretches like that where you're not scoring for a long time and it sucks. Like, you lose sleep. You you do things a lot different where you change the color of your tape or you eat different, whatever, like your whole life kind of gets spun from what you're used to. And so for him, I'm like for him to get that goal, had get it taken back. Like that could be the number one step to just the rest of your game, just boom, downhill, right? Like heartbreaker. Yeah. So to see him bounce back from that and, and set up a nice goal to where this team's struggling to score, making the right play, not for himself, but for the team. I mean, that's, that's exactly what you want in one of your star players. I think. And, and when you just keep buzzing, like Schmaltz is everywhere. He's, he's got a pretty smart game. Um, yeah. Those goals will come. I mean, they're for sure, especially the way they grind. Uh, so then the next night they go into Toronto, they get a goal right off the bat. Everything's looking good. Uh, for the most part, I thought, we were being outshot a little bit, but I thought the play was mostly being controlled by Utah. Mm -hmm. I thought that aggressive B swarm style four check was really working for us. We were creating a lot of turnovers and then the wheels fell off in the second period. Mm -hmm. And I saw a timeout, which I thought we should have done during the San Jose Sharks game. Actually, my son Tegan was like, they should call a timeout. They should call a timeout. Yeah, <laughs> yeah maybe, but definitely should have. Right. Um, talk about that. What do you, what do you think about the momentum in that game? And, and I mean, Pretty good first and third period, yeah. second period, kind of weird. First and third, super exciting and positive, right? And I think when when you look back on kind of like post-game interviews and, and media type stuff, the team really recognized that. Um, but, I mean, these guys are playing as the best players in the world, and if you take 20 minutes off, guys like Marner and Nylander, they're going to make you pay, right? So, um, but like like you said, like their forecheck was great in the first and third, and then we just get into penalty trouble, and I think 
when you get the best players in the world on a on a power play for 12 minutes in a game, like you're really shooting yourself in the foot. And it's you talk about momentum. That's a good way to not have any momentum. Um, but like kudos to the guys for getting back in the third because because they really bounced back and made that a game. That game could have been four one, five one, six one pretty easy. So yeah, I, I thought it was uh it, it was pretty crazy. Um, and then like we were talking about the the penalties and you talked about how that throws off your momentum and stuff like that. Let's talk for a second about I'm I'm actually gonna play a video here of Andre Torini, Coach Bear as we call him. And he's he's got some stuff he wants to talk about as far as penalties. This is after the Toronto game. It's a big issue, I think. You get on the road and you repeat the same mistake, the same guys, stick penalty and that kind of stuff. That's that's tough. That's that you know our game management, our game in the game cost us a lot today. From a, from bad change to uh, get in penalty trouble, then you know that kind of a stuff. It it costs you at some point. And we play a team who's playing well. They they, they had three win in a row. They they they're, they're not easy to play against. They fought. I think we had our chance. We we hit a post. We we got, we did a lot of good stuff. But uh, we need to help ourselves. So when you when you see a coach say stuff like, like you can see the frustration. For sure. Um, what, do you, what do you take of that? What do you take about what he said? So from personal experience, I actually played for him. Um, when I was in Colorado, he was one of my coaches, my U14 year. And that, from what I saw from him in that interview, and granted, I'm talking U14 to NHL, so this is way, 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 way <laughs> different, right? But he was a super, super happy guy. And so when I saw that interview from the bear that I know, he's pretty upset, right? Um, like penalties, the the bad change on I think it was the Marner goal, that breakaway goal. It's just like our Utah's so good, they're so fast, they're so exciting to watch. But you could tell like they're making the same mistakes, kind of game in and game out. That's really shooting in the foot because if you eliminate that, I mean, you eliminate that bad change led to the Marner goal. We have a two two game, or I mean, just as far as like momentum goes, I mean, you you kind of you almost second guess yourself to where you're, you get like, the more you think about staying out of the box or the more you think about bad changes, it seems like the more it happens and it keeps happening. Let's so, talk, let's talk about that for a second. Well, first off, like we talked about this a little bit before we were on there. We lead the, the Utah hockey club leads the league in penalty minutes. Yeah. That's not good. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's not good. No matter how you look at it, uh, that change we're, we're talking about two like one of the best defensemen in the world, of Sergeyev going off the ice, but the the puck was in the offensive zone, deep in the yeah. corner, and yeah. we had possession yeah. when he when he went to make that change. Yeah. And it's a long change, so I I didn't hate. Everybody keeps saying it was a bad change. I just think it was bad luck. Yeah, because I, I would never had a that. chance. Yeah, I would I would agree with that. I mean, when you watch it back, it is. It's like it happens like so fast to where he kind of commits to the change, and you could tell he got. I don't know if you watched it super close, but you could tell as soon as he got to the bench, he didn't even hop the boards. He kind of just stared and kind of watched. Like, you know, at that point, you're like, come on, man. Like, what do you want me to do? So helpless. Yeah, exactly. And that's that's one of those things, too, when you talk about, you know, you've got momentum and you're starting to – you had the slump buster game, and then something like that happens. And for certain Chip to see one of the best players, the top scorer in the NHL breaking down on a breakaway because you just changed, you're like – here we go again. Yeah. And it kind of turned out to be that way for a couple minutes. Did. Um, tell me about like, if you're constantly on the penalty kill, your, your lines can't get their flow. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's hard. And penalty killing's tough. Like it's not an easy part of the game, right? Like you, you use a lot of energy killing penalties. And so I know Schmaltz kills penalties. Um, but you got to think like your top players, like Keller who doesn't kill penalties. Um, as far as I have noticed anyway, he, his legs are getting stiff on the bench and you need a guy like that on the ice. Right. So the more you're keep like killing penalties, you're keeping those guys off the ice and you're only hurting yourself on top of that. Like guys like Schmaltz or, or Krauss or whoever, like some of your kind of your big dogs are worried about or spending all their energy killing penalties for 12 minutes a game. That takes away from a lot of offensive, um, the offensive side of your game too, that could, that could drag on. So that's just hard because like teams work best 
when you can roll four lines, right? And when you kind of break up that momentum, then things like guys miss out a lot of ice time and the guys get a lot more ice time. So, I mean, that kind of that, that, uh, that, that momentum on your bench could really mess things up in the long run of a 60 minute game. Yeah, for sure. And you, and you mentioned it and it was funny because during the Washington Capitals game, when they, they got a few penalties and I, I heard other people around me going, why do they keep putting Ovechkin in the box? Because yeah. he's not going to kill that penalty. Yeah, It's not exactly. his job. It's same. Just it's not Keller's job. You know, yeah. our friend Trevor Lewis has made an NHL career out of basically being the energizer bunny, just chasing down pucks on, you know, and just getting in the way on PK one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And that, like, what has he been in the league 16, 17 years now? Because he's a good penalty killer. He's got yeah, he close to a thousand games. Yeah, he just broke 100 points in a, almost a thousand games. So, yeah, clearly they weren't paying him to score goals. And that's <laughs> another thing a lot of people don't understand is it's not everybody's role to score goals. Yeah, I actually wanted to bring that up too. I didn't know if you're going to get to it, but I just wanted to like my appreciation for penalty killers because it's something that that I kind of did in Portland and with the Grizz, but. Like, I really have an appreciate, appreciation for guys like that. And guys like Stenlin are so crucial to your team. Like, I love watching that guy play. He's a face-off guy, kind of a glue guy. And um, penalty kill, he's awesome. Like, guys like that, they really can make – they can be this difference between having a championship team and, like, a first-round exit team. So, I just I just wanted to say my appreciation for that guy because I think he's really crucial to the team. Yeah, you know, I'm glad you brought that up because I, I can't remember if it was in one of the articles. Or, yeah, it was one of, one of the articles I wrote, a post-game review. And I just thought he was on the wrong line. And I, I mentioned that. I, I don't think he should be centering. I think he was on line three or line – I don't remember. But he's a he's a specialty guy. Yeah. I thought he was a little slow to be with the guys he was with. But the, and I got ripped apart by a few guys. Actually, uh, Jack Skilly kind of <laughs> tore me a little bit. He's like, you should – like, Stenland's a genius. Watch his game. I'm like, no, I get it. I know that he's amazing. And, you know, I did mention – like, I didn't mention, but he was like a minus eight or nine. He led the lead – or he led our team – and plus minus at the time at minus nine or eight. Mm-hmm. And I was like, you know, that sucks for him, but I understand his role and I see his importance of his role. Yeah. But yeah, it's, it's cool that you mentioned that because a guy like that, not on the score sheet a ton Mm-mm. and he's doing all the dirty work, man. He's, yeah. he's just, and as a center, you know how it is. You get just offensive zone, defensive zone. You're the guy just crushing and, and chasing and, and spending a ton of energy. So yeah, he's for sure. He's a, He's a great addition to the team. Another guy that I think gets a lot of bad online publicity that in my my eyes is actually kind of like the unofficial leader of the team. I'm not saying that Keller's not an amazing captain. Keller's doing his thing. But if you watch after every play, after every faceoff on the bench, <laughs> the guy talking, the guy directing is Ian Cole. Yeah. And the guy that's eating a lot of shots too. He is. I mean, yeah. he's a shot blocker. I've been really impressed with his game. I wondered if maybe – um, it was a desperation move by Utah to sign a guy that was I was old mm-hmm. for, by NHL specs, you know. But man, he's he's just been an absolute positive addition to the team, and like he eats up twenty two minutes a game, yeah, and just kills it. I I think, and I know he makes yeah. there's some sloppy plays, but I also think he's covering for other guys. And yeah, I mean Utah's a super young team, which is part of the reason we like him, right? And I actually wrote down they're the fifth youngest in NHL averaging 26 years old, but you could bring in a guy who I think I wrote down. He's, I think he's 35, like eight, almost 850 NHL games, two cups. Like when you talk about making, like when you talk about guys who, who win cup or teams that win cups, championships, all that stuff, it comes from guys like that, like that have um, veteran leadership that have experience in the playoffs, all that stuff. So, I mean, I love the signing by Utah. It's, it's it's genius. I mean, it's a guy that has been there. He's done that. Like, two cups speak for itself. And, like, you just can imagine the experience and the stories that he can preach to guys like Cooley who are just coming to the league and helping them get to that next step to really understand, like, what they're what they're in for, right? Like, like the first 20 games in the season that, that they've just played is going to be a lot different than the last 20. And – hopefully into playoffs, right? Like it's, it's a whole different animal. So to have a guy like that who can like not only on the ice, but in the locker room, really bring that team together and help them know what to expect is huge. Yeah. Agree a hundred percent. Uh, fact, you brought up Logan Cooley. I want to talk about him for a second too. And well, one, I, I wanted to say something before we moved on talking about PK and power, power play. Um, our PK 
Again, we lead the league in the most penalties, and we're 23rd in the league on PK percentage. So uh, those two things are going to cause you to lose some games. We we realized yeah. that, right? We knew you can't get away with it forever. Yeah. Um, but so now let's let's take a look at uh, the lines and kind of see more. Let's see, I'm trying to get us over to the right thing here. I'm not very good at this. All right, so can you see this? Yep, I got you. So one of the things I want to talk about is Clayton Keller on not just the power play, but on every time he's on the ice, he's an amazing setup guy. Yeah. And he's constantly going out and, and you know, he comes down and makes that Gretzky uh, turn out towards the mid boards and pulls up and looks for that amazing pass that, again, somehow you just have to have that vision. Mm-hmm. But I'd, I'd like to see him shoot more. I'd like to see him make the defense respect him a little bit and maybe pull D towards him more or, you know, respect him as a shot. Yeah. Am I, am I nuts for thinking that, or we just let him keep doing what he's always done? No, of course not. I mean, you'd always like to see any, like these guys, like I said, I've said this a hundred times on this episode, but you guys are so skilled, right? And I think the last three seasons he has 28 goals, 37 goals, 33 goals. Like that's, that's pretty legit. You'd be a 30 goal scorer in the NHL. That's your, I would consider you a goal scorer, right? And so, yeah, you'd like to see him um, shoot the puck a lot, but it's just it's there's so much there's so much gray area. I think I I mean personally, you look at the the shots the team shots. I don't think there's many games that we've outshot a lot of teams, right? So I, I think I'd like to see anybody shoot it, but I mean, obviously, you put up thirty goals in NHL, you can score. Yeah, I mean, shoot the puck. Yeah, yeah, I think, I, and normally he does. I don't yeah. know what's going on. To me, I think Logan Cooley. <laughs> is showing himself as probably one of our most consistent um, like opportunity generator. And it, it makes me wonder if he shouldn't be that line one center. And at the beginning of the year, I thought he was struggling a little bit in his mm-hmm. role as a line two center. Cause that's, that's a huge role in the NHL. Cause you're matched For up. Sure. You're always matched up against the other line, like the other, either the top line or the third line. And the third line is usually just a bunch of guys that are just there to shut you down. Right. Yeah. So I kind of, I thought about that, but there's that potential. You're taking all your best players and putting them on one line. Uh, what's, what's your input on that? Yeah. You definitely kind of want to spread the love around. Right. And I think, I think him and Gunther play really well together. Um, obviously in the Pittsburgh game, they connect really well together. Um, I think on that line in particular, from, from what we're looking at, I think uh, McBain's been awesome and he's kind of that, the, the gritty side of that line. But um yeah, I don't know. Like center's hard because it's it's such like a it honestly could change depending on how you're doing the faceoffs that night. But Cooley and Gunther play really well together. Um, Smaltz and Keller play really well together. And then yeah, maybe you maybe you change it up a little bit like Hayton and and Cooley and and flip them around. But I mean, as as time goes, I guarantee you're going to see that matchup and it's going to get its its time to shine. And and I guess we'll see what happens. Yeah. Well, Schmaltz and Keller do play well together. They've been playing together since before they were on this team. With yeah. The uh, U.S. developmental program and stuff, but and it's cool to see a couple of Americans just show sure. that out. Yeah, <laughs> we love our Americans. <laughs> uh, so what about our goaltending? What 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 are your thoughts on goaltending this year? Um, yeah, definitely not my expertise, so I'm not going to do much critiquing there. But um, I have really, really enjoyed watching the Melka play. Um, kind of his coming out party to me personally was that game against Carolina, right. and. Yeah, he was crazy during the game, right? But the thing I think I love the most is when the game ended and he was announced as a star and he came out just fist pumping, smiling. Like, you see guys having that much fun, like, that are that passionate. Like, it just makes you love the game, I think. So, yeah, I I agree 100%. And I I look back the last two years, it seems like uh, Veggie and and Connor Ingram have been just kind of going back and forth on who's the Mm -hmm. actual starter. And this is a contract year for Vamelka. Mm-hmm. So this 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 is a great time for him to kind of bust out, and he currently he's tied for first in the league with save percentage at ninety four percent. That's crazy. We're being outshot every night, and he's just kind of been that guy we need. Uh, a couple of articles I talked about the need of our goaltenders to steal games, and I know Connor Ingram did that last year, and he led the league or he was tied for the league lead with six shutouts last year, which says a lot with yeah. as bad as Arizona sure. was last year. Um, we're not 
defensively, we're a lot better this year than Arizona has ever been, I think. And we're only going to get better when we get Marino and Dursey back. Yeah. Those two are like, I mean, that's that's got to be your sec, probably D2 and D4. Yeah. I would say. Yeah. Big, um, big, big shoes to fill for sure. Yeah. So I, I think we keep getting better. In the meantime, we need a guy like Vimelka who's doing what he's doing. He's, <laughs> he's consistent. It kind of shocks me because, you know, he moves really well, but he also seems a little cumbersome sometimes. He honestly, and I'm, I'll get a lot of heat for saying this, but he reminds me of the way I play with, especially with the goal that got banked on him from the goal line last night. That happens to me all the time <laughs> because I'm a, I'm a little bit more funky, I guess. Yeah. And sometimes he looks that way to me, but man, he's always in the right spot. He seems to have a good battle and he's got really good rebound control. Yeah. Yeah, he's been awesome for sure. Yeah, like I said, like technic technicality wise, I can't do much critiquing on the goalies, but um, he's, I mean, when like that Carolina game, for instance, I, what do you make forty nine saves or forty nine? I saves. mean, he's he's getting a lot of a lot of pucks thrown at him, and as a player, that that can really change how you play defensively. Like maybe you cheat a little bit offensively because you know and you're confident in who you have in net to kind of save your bacon on the back end. So it's always good to have a guy who's con consistent like that. As a player, you feel a lot better about things. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Uh, what are your thoughts on the, tonight's game against Montreal? What do you think is going to happen? What I don't needs know, man. To happen? I, I hope they. I hope we see a lot of the first and third period against Toronto. I hope we see that again. And when you listen to to kind of things that they said after the game, I I think that they know exactly exactly what I said. Like there's so much upside and getting out of that Pittsburgh game with the win finally, now they're feeling good. And I think there's things that feel good about the Toronto game too that are going to roll right into right into that Montreal game. And I, I will speak to this as a player, when you are in a slump, your team's in a slump, and you get to go on a week-long road trip with the guys, sometimes that's the best thing for it. So um, you'd, you'd hope that as they've been gone for as, as long as they have, that, you know, bonding is – I mean, they spend every day together, so it's not like – they're not bonding, but like, but being on the road together is different, right? So you'd hope that being into in the fourth game of this road trip that that they're really connecting and like I said, just building off of the Pittsburgh game and the first and third from the Toronto game, and I think they're gonna do do just fine. Yeah, I, I've actually aside for a few minutes, we've said this about a few of their games too. There's just a few minutes where they broke down and it cost them the game, and that just shows you how dangerous the NHL is when you're when yeah. you just mess up a tiny bit. Those guys are going to take advantage of you for sure. And, uh, but other than that, I've been really impressed with the play and there was a, like some negative comment online. One of the guys like, Oh, you could take, you could take the team out of Arizona, but you can't take Arizona out of the team or the coyotes mm -hmm. or whatever. And I'm like, man, I just can't with you right now. If you, yeah. if you didn't see the, how much progress that team made, against what's basically the New York Yankees of the NHL, the team that buys every player that's good. You yeah. Know, and yeah, they didn't have Austin Matthews, but they've been doing better without him anyway. Yeah. So for our team to play that strong and lose by one goal, I saw the fight that I wanted to see. and I saw some comeback. Speaking of fighting, I actually saw body contact. Yeah. Both in the Pittsburgh game and in the Toronto game. Yeah. Which I've barely seen any of, and I get that I'm an old school player. Maybe the new NHL doesn't hit as much. But I saw a lot of guys separating guys from the puck. Which yeah. I thought was going to make a lot of progress going forward. I hope that continues. It seems to be working. Yeah. I think even like, I mean, not to, to be that guy, but even when there's like scrums after the whistle, like there's guys in there to help. There's nobody on the outskirts. Right. And that's what you want to see in a team because you know that they want to fight for their brothers. Like, if, if there's guy, if you get into a scrum and there's two guys in and three guys out, then you're kind of worried about team chemistry and all that stuff. But I mean, every time it seems lately that any one of them's into it, the rest of them are into it. And I, I think that speaks, speaks volumes about the kind of team they are. Yeah, I think so too. I, I honestly, I'm getting pretty excited to see how, you know, let's, let's see how the next 21 games go, but I, I'm pretty impressed with the progress we've made so far. Um, I'm excited to see what happens. I wonder if, we see Stauber in that tonight. That might be kind of interesting to see how that goes. Yeah, yeah. I don't know much about him, so that would be interesting. Yeah, when we haven't had a lot of guys get called up for, yeah. you know, for this far into the season to only have a couple guys, you know, um, Maverick gets called up, and he's been yeah. doing, for the most part, been doing really well. 
There are some rookie mistakes that you expect to see, which is funny. I didn't see him in like his first five games. He seemed to just make all the right decisions and he's had a couple mistakes since then. And he keeps mm-hmm. getting penalties, which that'll get you sent down pretty quick. If you, yeah, that's a maturity issue a lot of times. Yeah. So I don't know. I, I'm pretty excited about it. And uh, what's your, what's your prediction? Who, who wins tonight? What's the score? I got to say Utah takes it. I'm going four, two. Nice. That's exactly what I was going to say. <laughs> I'm going to go four, one. I'm going to give veggie a, a little more credit. Nice. I like it. Well, Mason, uh, thank you so much for joining the show. I think we should do this a lot more. Totally. Um, The shows, we're going to just keep going on with the NHL, and and we're going to talk about the Utah Grizzlies. So next week we should get together and talk about the NHL and talk about the Grizzlies. Yeah. And uh, I want to think – also, I got to think – I got a new sponsor. It's called Only Crowns. I said Only Crowns. (laughs) And that officially kicks in next week. You'll see all the the stuff. We'll be talking about them. But I just thought, man, a dentist? Like – a crown yeah. thing sponsoring a hockey show talk about a dead on match right that's perfect yeah no kidding <laughs> that's so, good they might get some good business through the hockey world so <laughs> i think they're gonna get a, look hockey's just gonna keep growing here we're gonna have more and more hockey players i've got several teeth i think your dad was there when some of mine got knocked out he might have been oh, the, nice might have been the one that knocked them out on accident <laughs> i don't know um so yeah hockey players need crowns all the time always yep. oh yeah you have all your own teeth yeah, I got pretty lucky. I broke the bottom four, but everything's everything is is real. Nice. Nothing had to get fixed too bad. So that's very cool. Also, want to thank Nick Archer. I don't know if you can see my uh, my Yeti jersey. Is that a prediction? Yeah, I think it's I think it's gonna happen, man. What do you think? I don't know. I this is gonna sound crazy, and I've heard other people say this, so maybe it's not that crazy. But I don't hate what it is now. Yeah, like I I love the jersey so much that like i almost don't want that to change i guess maybe more so than anything else but um but i I do think it's gonna be yeti i guess is my prediction i think it's gonna be yeti i think the jerseys are basically gonna stay as they are yeah maybe the addition of one jersey having a yeti logo on it somewhere and i think maybe the instead of the inaugural patch on the shoulders you're gonna see a yeti there but it's going to say utah across the front this is my That's, guess and it's also yeah. something that chris armstrong has said ish i might be paraphrasing or i might have read stuff into what he's saying but um i've been around these guys quite a bit i know that i know that yeti was like overall like 80 percent of the vote oh the guys voted that way yeah no well, not yeah. just the guy i like just everybody that voted when it when it went out oh oh i got you yeah, yeah when it came back like it was uh and i I don't know that this is the official. I don't know where I can't remember exactly where I heard this, but I heard like ages 25 and older were voting for, you know, outlaws and yeah. uh, mammoth and stuff like that. And then 25 and younger was almost 90% Yeti. Yeah. So it's going to be the next generation's team anyway. Like we're, I'm just glad to be here and I'm going to watch it for the rest of my life. That's kind of how I am too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, and I, honestly, I don't care. And I'm fine with the Utah hockey club. But yeah. it would be cool to say, like, the yet, you know, instead of saying UHC or welcome to, you know, if you're the guy screaming, welcome him onto the ice, it'd be cool to say the Yeti instead of having to say the whole Utah Hockey Club. Yeah, yeah. That's, I think that's the biggest thing for me is I love that it says Utah on it just because oh, yeah. being from Utah, I mean, I guess that's the only thing. But other than that, yeah, who cares? We got NHL here, so that's all that matters. <laughs> that's exactly my sentiment. <laughs> all right, Mason. Well, we'll get back in touch with you. We'll talk about the Grizzlies. I know uh, they're not off to the start they wanted to be, but, uh, you know, Ryan Kness, which was pretty excited about the team he was going to have. So I, my guess is they're going to be good. I just I can't yeah. see them not being good the whole time. So yeah. I, I imagine they're gonna, they've had some pull-ups and they're going to figure some stuff out. Yeah, I got a big heart for the Grizzlies over there, so I'm always down to talk about them. Oh, yeah, I'll never forget when you were a little kid and your voicemail said you've reached Mason Maddock from the Utah Junior Grizzlies. <laughs> like you were destined to play for the team, bud. Maybe, maybe. Who knows? And it's too bad. Next time we're on, we're going to have to talk the whole thing about the trade and what kind of made you decide to step yeah. away from the Grizzlies. Yeah, it's, it's a, probably a longer story than these guys want to hear, but we could definitely talk about it. I'm sure. there You've got a ton of fans here, man. I, Every time I bring you up or write an article about you or anything, people still love you here. And, no. um, you know, you're not too far removed. So people yeah. want to hear and we'll we'll get it all discussed. I appreciate it. Yeah, everyone treated me so well. I, I owe everyone a lot of stuff, a lot of things. So, 
All right. Well, big thanks to Mason Manic for coming on the show. Big thanks to Only Crowns for being our sponsor that starts next month. Uh, I want to thank Chipman Roofing for being the sponsor for the last year. It was awesome to have them on board. Uh, again, thanks to Nick Archer for getting me some threads, getting ready to be a, a Yeti. And that is the Utah Puck Report.